Hello everybody and welcome to another Doctor Who review. Time for a classic TV series story starring the third Doctor, John Pertwee. It's the Sea Devils! Now when I was doing research for this story, I noticed that it's actually 50 years the week this video was released since the Sea Devils was first broadcast on BBC television. So, there's a little bit extra to this than anything else, and it was kind of inspired off the fact there's going to be a Sea Devil story at Chris, uh, Christmas, Easter, <laughs> uh, for series uh, between series 13 and obviously the new Doctor coming out next year in 2023. So it's one of the specials. Um, so I thought, you know, let's let's delve into why the Sea Devils have got such an interest and go into the story they first debuted in. As always, I have with me here the well-thumbed and well-loved dog-eared television companion and here is the plot synopsis for this story the doctor and joe visit the master in his high security prison on an island off the south coast of england and hear from the governor colonel trenchards that ships have been mysteriously disappearing at sea investigating the doctor learns from captain hart commander of a nearby naval base that the sinkings have centred around an abandoned sea fort. He and Joe then visit the fort and are attacked by what one of the men there terms a sea devil, an amphibious breed of the prehistoric creatures encountered by the Doctor shortly after his exile to Earth. The Master, aided by a misguided trenchard, is stealing equipment from the naval base in order to build a machine to revive the sea devils from hibernation. The Doctor takes a diving bell down to the sea devils underwater base to try and encourage peace. His efforts are frustrated by a depth charge attack ordered by a pompous politician, Walker. But in the confusion, he manages to free a captured submarine and escape back to the surface. The Sea Devils then capture the naval base, and the Master has the Doctor taken back to their control centre, where he forces him to help him finish the machine. The Doctor sabotages the machine, and the two Time Lords escape together, just as the base is destroyed in an explosion. So, the third story of Season 9 of Doctor Who. The Sea Devils, first broadcast on the 26th of February. 1972 so that means it's 50 years since the episode first came out how interesting overall it's an interesting romp um it's six parts it may be a little bit too long for six parts it's probably better as a four but that's the problem with most of the six parts of the 70s if you've got one plot line it doesn't work the only exception really is the green death which does seem to fit within its six episode runtime but the rest of the stories that do six parts are a little bit draggy. Another story that's six parts later this season is also draggy, but we'll, we'll discuss that when we get to it in the reviews. But let's get into some of the characters and just have a look at um, some of the main characters and main cast of this story. So we have, of course, the third Doctor, John Pertwee. Now, when I first saw this story, I wasn't fully enamoured with the way the role of the Doctor was being played. And I think possibly it's kind of an emotional state sometimes when I watch stories because this one I wasn't fussed of. I wasn't fussed of the character, I wasn't fussed of the story, I wasn't fussed of anything else. But actually watching this time, there's a very, very warm bond between the Doctor and Joe in this one. And it shows by the way that she follows and cares for him and and searches things out, which I'll get to with Katie Myers' character in a minute. But I actually quite like the way that John Pertwee's character here works. He does bristle a little bit with the pomposity of, of establishment. He does that a bit with the uh, politician Walker later on when he comes in. He's basically trumped up civil servants at the end of the day. So Walker comes in and he's very bristled towards Walker's. Walker's been very selfish and self-centred natural enough. Pertwee's character does have a lot of that with any of the politicians he comes up against. He's quite brusque with them. But overall, he's quite a, a genial fellow. And um, I think it's probably because it shows that John Pertwee's very relaxed in the role at this point. He's enjoying what he's getting and he's enjoying doing the roles. I think it's also because he gets his favourite line to say or the, the line that's most associated with him in this for the very first time. I reverse the polarity of the neutron flow. And the, the reverse of the polarity or reverse of something happens for the rest of the series with him. It's last said in The Five Doctors, which I've already reviewed, but it's first said here in The Sea Devils. It's an interesting story. It's an interesting setup. The fact that um, humans are interfering with um, the Silurians, the Silurian race again, or in this case, the Eocenes, as they call it here, which is still wrong. But they're, they're called Cloak of the Sea Devils, and that's obviously what the, the story is named as well. But Pertwee plays it quite quite solidly in here, and there's there's the mix of the 
the avuncular uncle that you get in Pertwee from this point onwards and you also get the kind of bristleness that you get of the early Pertwee as well in between. It's a really nice development and blend of the character by this point and you can tell he's enjoying every moment of doing it. He loves the action stuff and he's out on the water there on the jet ski and when he's chasing the master and, and um, some of the, the action sequences he's, he's loving he's loving the whole the whole thing and he you can tell why he was so comfortable and loved doing the role at this point because it just shines through in his performance it really does. What also shines through is his relationship with Katie Manning as Joe Grant. Katie Manning is traditionally a a character or person who's mad as a box of frogs and I think this kind of loyalty factor and this kind of love and um, seriousness that she brings to it is there. I love the inquisitiveness for Joe Grant and it's good that they don't kind of shy away from the, the that because she was you know she is she is, can be perils of Pauline but a lot of the time she does seem to have quite a bit of um, strength about her and independence about her and it shows again here when she tries to escape from the prison that the master's in uh, when the doctor gets captured and um, it's interesting to see that and see the independence still there because you would have thought a season and a half down the line that the character would have been diluted and more of a plot device and it I suppose in some ways it is a plot device but it's in an intelligent way and um I have no problems with the characterization. I have no problems with the way Katie Manning plays it. It's quite, it's quite fun, and I, I do enjoy seeing that. I think the standout for me has got to be the master played by Roger Delgado. The frisson between him and the Third Doctor, that kind of grudging respect, but also that kind of scheming planning that the master has, really works here. The best bits are when they're they're up against each other, either verbally sparring when they're trying to convince the leader of the Silo the Sea Devils, no, they said Silurians, leader of the Sea Devils not to attack the humans, and the Master's doing the opposite. You need to attack the humans because they're a big threat, and obviously the depth charge kind of uh, reinforces that for the, for, the, for the Sea Devils, which is a bit of a shame, and the interplay there. But they actually do a kind of sparring properly with a sword fight, and that seems quite fun to do. A lot of stage moves, of course. I like the whole... The presence of it and the whole fact that they're, they're sparring out and trying to work with each other and trying to seek each other out and they do it through the metaphor of a sword fight is quite fun. And the, the whole sparring and the relationship between the Doctor and the Master really works and Roger Delgado is a brilliant actor, he's a brilliant villain and um, you can see he relishes his role with a plum. There is one scene, of course, with the Master, which I think is quite well, and it's a well-known scene. It's, it's the scene with the Master, and he's watching an episode of The Clangers. Now, everybody thinks the Master doesn't know who the Clangers are, but if you actually look at the whole scene, and you look at what's happening with it, Trenchard comes in, he talks about it being a kids' TV programme, and the Master thinks it's an interesting extraterrestrial broadcast. Because Trenchard didn't get the joke and the fun of it, the Master's looking a bit grumpy afterwards. And most people don't recognise that because they tend to cut that reaction out before they get to it. But the myth isn't there, it's actually the, doc the Master is playing about. And you see that in the sound of drums when he comes back in and watches the Teletop he's in, in series three of the new series. So the Master does have a sense of humour there and a bit of um, joy in the way he plays the role. A couple of other characters in here. I will quickly go with um, Walker, the um, civil servant played by Martin Boddy. Thoroughly pompous, thoroughly, I suppose, yes, Minister Sir Humphrey in the way he will do his own way. He'll do it for the best for the government and the country and very selfish and self-serving and gets everybody into hot water because of his actions, which is always the way it works with these things, isn't it? Then you've got two other characters I'm going to mention here. You have Captain Hart, played by Edwin Richfield. Very brusque, very much of the commander, what are you doing? How dare you come in here and rule? But he softens very quickly to the Doctor and understands the Doctor's there as a kind of... He's, he's like a substitute brigadier, really, is Captain Hart in this one. He's kind of like the figure of authority, but is willing for the Doctor to help when he realises the Doctor's only there to try and solve the mystery of the missing ships and the mystery of the sea devils and to try and get things working and I love I love the fact that the the relationship blossoms into something of a respect by the end and a grudging respect and Hart doesn't like the idea of trying to carry out Walker's orders but kind of has to because he's, he's got to follow orders he's got to be the soldier and then we've got Colonel Trenchard played by Clive Morton the kind of henchman the kind of duped um, assistant of the master 
And the way that Trenchard, he's kind of like an old man who wants to try and have a bit more glory before he retires, and the way he goes about it is quite cute. And it's, it's actually quite sad when he gets killed by the Sea Devils when they attack the prison later in, in the middle of the story. I think that's quite cute. Uh, quite sad, rather. And, um, yeah, I do like the way the character is played. There are lots of good things in the Sea Devils, lots, lots of things that, that work, lots of things that don't. I've mentioned the sword fight. I've mentioned the interplay between um, Walker and the other characters with the depth charge. The Sea Devils themselves are, are played quite well. Pat Gorman's the main Sea Devil here. And the, the, the kind of voice, the hissy voice, is kind of like, well, it's kind of, it's kind of, bubbly like they're underwater i like i like the way they've 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 utilized it and i wonder if they'll do that for the the special that comes up in a couple of months time um and whether they'll get down to that i do like the way the sea devils are they seem to have a similar thinking to they think the planet is theirs they disappeared because of the fear of a of a of a, a big asteroid or big planet coming to collide in it wasn't it was the moon they kept with that theory at that point and the fact that it was stuck in hibernation, the hibernation didn't work, and it's kind of like creatures from another time coming up and and seeing things. And they are they are the monsters of Earth. They are Earth creatures, but they're Earth monsters, and it's really interesting to see. I love the fact they've got six of them, and they all come out of the water at various points. And the bit I do that the, 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 there's good scenes in there. You've got the escape when they escape the prison. Doctor and Joe escape the prison. They have to go through the minefield. And the whole situation in the minefield, that's a classic scene, especially the sonic screwdriver blowing up the mines and the sea devil running off again because it's getting hurt from all the explosions. The fight scenes with the Navy and the fact they use the Navy quite in this Navy base as, as extras effectively in the whole fight scene uh, with the sea devils and the way the sea devils come up and try and use their ray guns to kill all the, all the, all the, all the people. It's interesting how the, the sea devils kind of have a motive of protection and... Um, some of the scenes are quite quite uh, fun with that. It's quite quite a good little story to enjoy and have a romp with. I do think it is a bit long though. I think it's maybe two episodes too long. I do think it doesn't quite work for the six episodes. But I understand where they're going from and where they've got to go, what they've got to do to try and get some sort of life out of this because obviously the budget is not too bad. The one thing I I really noticed it the first time I saw this, and I see this again, and I've seen I, I re, it reinforces the point by seeing it for this review again. The Doctor bribes the sailor, so does Joe, but the Doctor bribes the sailor, and I don't think the Doctor carried money, and it's not it's it, it feels out of I think that's possibly what made me a bit more iffy about it the first time. It's out of character for the Doctor, and once you get past that, it, it, you know the character's there for the Doctor, but the fact he bribes the sailor with money. It's really weird. It's really strange. The idea of the sea devils wanting to revive and live on the planet and have the planet to themselves and the, their way is the best way. There's a very, there's a very allegoric uh, left wing ideology sitting there with that, and that's a very Malcolm Holt script. Malcolm Holt was very good of his his left wing ideologies and the way he does stuff with that he doesn't such an allegory that it kind of works it shouldn't but it does it kind of works and it's interesting now i've mentioned malcolm clark before more recently is the music and um i didn't realize he went this far back but here he is again with the synths and the, the way the sims are this it's not there's not really any music as such it's more like incidental cues and leap motifs that come in here but it works it works and it gives the sense of the 70s uh, feel, the early 70s feel you get from the Pertwee era. It's definitely a Pertwee era sounding music soundtrack and I actually quite like it. I think, again, I think the scoring kind of undertones like it does in Resurrection of the Daleks, which is the last uh, review I did with his music. It does heighten the tension at the, the times it needs to and it, it, it does the job and it's, it's quite inoffensive. Overall, it's a lovely action piece, and Michael E. Bryant's very good at his action pieces. He's done a lot of good action stuff before this. He's maybe not Douglas Canfield level when it comes to the strength of his direction, but he's he's very good at at at, at, at the set pieces. He, the direction there with Havoc really helps because the stunt team is Havoc for the last time, 
and that really helps. I just like the direction. I like I like the story. I'm quite keen on the story in regards to the way it, it runs along. I do think it's too long, though. I really do think it's too long, and I think it would be better as four episodes, and I've said this multiple times, because it's true. There's a bit of back and forth going between the prison and, and the medieval base that could be cut out. They could get to the bit uh, with the diving bell and the Doctor being captured by the Sea Devils after the diving bell a bit quicker. But overall... It's not a bad wee story. It's not quite take your brain out. There's a little bit more to it, but it's not it's not top level for me. It's kind of it's middling, uh, but high middling. So I give this a rating of three and a half Tardises out of five. So let's see how this story fits in with the rest of the John Pertwee era I've reviewed so far, and also how this story fits in with the rest of the Doctor Who TV stories I've reviewed so far as well. The Sea Devil sits at three and a half tards out of five alongside the three doctors. At the top, with four and a half tards out of five, is Inferno. Overall, we still have Time Lash and Sleep No More with two and a half tards out of five at the bottom, and at the very top is still six stories, including Inferno at four and a half tards out of five, The Happiness Patrol, The Day of the Doctor, The Case of Androsani, The Tomb of the Cybermen, and Dalek. That's it for this Doctor Who review. Leave a comment down below and tell me what you think of the Sea Devils. Do you like it? Leave a comment down below. Do you not like it? Leave a comment down below. As always, if you like this video, don't forget to like it and share it with the hashtag TeamStructor. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you like the channel as a whole. And the notification bell so you know when a new video comes out. General rule, new video every Sunday at 4pm GMT. This Sunday is Six Facts on David Livingston. Hopefully I can join you for that. Hopefully, I'll see you in a week and a half's time with the live stream for March, the stream stopped for March on the 6th of March. But until then, thanks guys for watching as always, and I'll see you later. <laughs>